In this episode of Pilbara Insights, we'll explore two main types of budgeting, incremental budgeting and responsibility-centered management, the advantages and disadvantages of each type, their relationship with strategic planning, which type tends to work better in a downturn, and the importance of scenario modeling. Budget allocations drive behaviour and incentivise behaviour and disincentivise other behaviours far more than strategic plans. Yeah, I think one of the critical strategic issues with budgeting styles is how to create that strategic overlay. So you've really got to have the ability to budget in three dimensions. You've got to be able to budget over time. You've got to be able to budget between organisational units. And you've got to be able to budget across activities. You are listening to Pilbara Insights, the podcast, the first dedicated audio series to support higher education leaders in their academic resource management decisions. The series will showcase the industry's most respected and experienced experts, explore the topics of program review and optimization, course evaluation, faculty effort, departmental research, planning and budgeting, and the key benefits of activity-based cost modeling for evidence-based decision-making. Hello and welcome to episode three of Pilbara Insights. I'm your host, Lee Patterson, and today I'm talking to Chris Grange, the former Chief Operating Officer at the Australian National University. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Lee. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. In today's episode, uh, we'll be discussing planning and budgeting. So to start with, Chris, what are different types of budgeting nowadays at uh, universities? Look, I think, Lee, that the academic accountants describe lots of different types of budgeting models. And there are many variations and many different names that are placed on these models. But if you look at what happens typically, in, at least in Australian universities and to a large extent in North American universities, what you find is there are two principal styles of budgeting that people use. One you would generally call incremental budgeting. And, yeah. and that's the style of budgeting where the amount that you're allocated in next year is a plus or a minus to some degree on what you're allocated last year. It's a very centralised model of budgeting. Yep. It's a model which really is driven by the vice chancellor, the president, perhaps the CFO or the executive or an executive committee. But it's it's an area where it's a style of budgeting which is really popular with vice chancellors because it gives them a really solid ability to align their strategy with the university with the allocation of resources inside the university. Yeah. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got a style of budgeting. Well, it's a bit more than that. It's almost a management philosophy called responsibility centre management. Yeah, yeah. And as a style of budgeting, that's a style where income is allocated to the units that earn it. And those individual units receive all of their revenue, all of the income, including tuition from students who are enrolled in particular programs, including their research income. Yep. Now, there's often combined with that an overhead charge. And so, so there's a charge for central administration. There's a charge for this. There's a charge for that. But, but it means that the leaders of individual academic units have a degree of certainty about how much money they'll receive each year and they can make their own plans accordingly. So you've got to think of those two styles of budgeting as almost on opposite ends of a spectrum and many universities find some kind of middle ground across that spectrum yeah so if i make some basic comparisons between the two extremes if you like incremental budgeting tends to be a fairly centralized budgeting method whereas responsibility center management is a very local style yep. of budgeting yeah Incremental budgeting has uncertainty about the way incentives do or don't work because an individual academic or operator unit doesn't know how much it will get next year. It can't predict, it can't plan, it can't strategize to make more money. Whereas responsibility centre management, the incentives are quite clear. If I get more students, if I get more research, if I do more of this, I'll get more income. Yeah. There's also, I think, a difference in the internal dynamics. So 
I mean, one of the problems with the responsibility centre management over the long run is that it does tend to encourage competitive behaviour within the university. So individual academic units competing for resources. Yep. Whereas incremental budgeting can be, at its best, a more collaborative approach to allocating resources within the university. Of course, at its worst, it can just be a very top-down executive decision on resource allocation that's not necessarily collaborative in the traditional academic sense. Yeah. But there's one other thing I really want to focus on when looking at the two. And to do that, I just want to step back for a minute. You know, I've worked in universities for over 30 years, and that meant I was involved in the formulation of years and years of university strategic plans under a host of different vice chancellors and university councils. And, you know, I came to a view over that period of time that budget allocations drive behaviour and incentivise behaviour and disincentivise other behaviours far more than strategic plans. Okay. And more importantly, I observed over a, a number of different strategic plans a failure to find a good way of linking the university's strategic plan to budget allocations. So it's not atypical to see a university strategic plan that has a variety of commendable goals. Yep. But when you look for the connection within the resource allocation, within the budget of the university to that strategic plan, usually we'll find a small allocation of funds to the strategic initiatives, but oftentimes 80 or 90 or 95% of resources are allocated according to either time-honoured tradition yep. or some sort of allocation formulas. Yep. Yep. And so you know, I think one of the critical strategic issues with budgeting styles is how to create that strategic overlay. And you'd have to say that the incremental style of budgeting gives you a better opportunity to do that. Uh, that's not to say that everyone capitalises on that opportunity, but yep. but potentially there's a better opportunity there. Yeah, so you've got the two major schools of thought there. There's the centralised, then there's the decentralised. Which ones do you think enable or allow more collaboration with the schools and departments at the university? Look, I think, I actually think that both offer opportunities. I've thought about this a lot. I, I guess two or three years ago, I was thinking that incremental budgeting probably offered a better opportunity for collaboration and teamwork. But when I unpack that, you know, it's really about teamwork at the leadership level within the university. And I think if there's good teamwork, either of any budget model can be made to suit its purpose. Yep. On the other hand, if, if the team dynamic with the university is competitive or cutthroat or dysfunctional in some other way, it doesn't really matter which kind of budgeting you use. There are people who will game it. There will, are people who will turn it to their own ends. There are people who will reverse engineer it for specific outcomes. So, yeah, I think budgeting is really important, but I don't think you can technically say that a budget model will create the ideal collaborative environment. That's really a leadership requirement, not a budgeting requirement. Yeah. I was just thinking about how much the schools and departments actively participate in this process. They've got a lot of incentive to participate to uh, make sure their schools and departments are properly funded to do what they need to do. But I don't know if anyone gets... So just to break out the planning from the budgeting side, whether any universities do plan for major downturns like we have at the moment with the pandemic. So if they do do that type of scenario planning and whether they should do that type of scenario planning. I think it's self-evident that they should, isn't it? Particularly in the circumstances that we're experiencing at the moment. But if you think of scenario planning, let's take a couple of examples. I think it's very common in most universities that they have some sort of crisis management plan or business continuity plan yep. that they use to rehearse major issues that might arise. And yeah, that's not dissimilar to the way the public service rehearses for a change of government 
or the way the military rehearses for potential future conflicts. Or perhaps even more relevantly, this is what the financial services, the investment management industry does so well. You know, if you look at some of the big investment firms, I'm I'm talking about merchant banks, investment houses, people like this, they have taken scenario planning to a level that's all their own. Part of the reason for that is that money as a subject matter lends itself to calculation and modelling. And so if you look at some of the firms I've worked with, they actually have a library of scenarios. So they have people who've thought about as many possible scenarios as they can imagine. Banks do this too and do it very well in terms of managing liquidity and preparing for adverse events. And it is not different or more difficult for universities to do this. So if we take the current example of the pandemic, you don't have to be able to predict there's going to be a pandemic and run a model for that. You just have to be capable of running a variety of upturn and downturn and what-if models. Yeah. And if you've got a sufficient range and variety of them, what you'll find is that one of those scenarios is very close, if not identical, to the real-world scenario that emerges. Yeah. So I know that in my previous role at ANU, we did do some scenarios. We didn't imagine a pandemic, but we did imagine a range of downturns and we built models on what the impact of those downturns would be. We were able to quantify what those downturns would be. We estimated how many years that would last for. And we estimated when we might see an uptake or not. And that leads into some really interesting decision points about the maintenance of reserves, about debt management, about multi-year budgeting. Yep. These are all things that are absolutely critical. And you can start pretty simply. I mean, we started by just rerunning the global financial crisis. Yep. And then we added a major international student downturn into our scenarios. And then we added, we said, well, what if both happen at the same time? So we added a third scenario that was a combination of both. But you can see you can just add to those and you don't have to do them all at once. But over a number of years, the technology now allows you to create those scenarios and to rerun them over and over again. And this is where finance and banking are really good because they've got their scenarios automated and they can run them once a day, once a month, once a year, whenever they like, and they can see what the outcomes of those scenarios are as circumstances change. Yeah, funny you should mention the financial services because they are big users of activity-based costing as well because they can get down into that low level of uh, resource usage and then do the same sorts of things that we do with our predictive models is using that historical information to be able to then forecast out what the impact will be for major changes for those scenarios they put together. And in fact, we did the same thing uh, with one of our scenarios where we don't know what the cause is going to be. So in this case, it was a pandemic, but we ran scenarios where there was a big downturn in international students. So, you know, what happens um, financially to the organisation when that happens? And then what things can you do to to work around it? Now, another interesting thing you mentioned too was the um, one-year versus multi-year budgeting. Is it common to do a detailed multi-year budget or is it more of a high-level forecast? I can't comment on how widespread it is. I mean, anecdotally, I think more and more universities are looking beyond the single year and looking at what a notional budget looks like for the year after. A number of universities are looking at three-year budgets or rolling three-year budgets. Some are looking at rolling five-year budgets where there might be a greater degree of precision about next year's budget. And there are obviously some vagaries in the year after that and after that. And by the time you get to five, there are questions about how accurate it is. But that longer-term approach to budgeting is, I think, really important for a couple of reasons, one of which is that it 
does tend to draw in the wider questions of balance sheet management and asset management within the university. Yeah. The other is because of that point I made earlier about a strategic link. University strategy is not a one-year issue. It's a multi-year issue. Yeah. So you can't have kind of consumerist one-year budgeting while you're pursuing a five-year strategy for the future of the university. The other two, one of the points of alignment that you need to create is a parallel between the horizon you're looking at with your strategic plan and the horizon you're looking at with your budgeting. Yep. And that's an interesting point, the difference between a strategic view and an operational view, because I was asking Professor Bill Massey about that in one of the previous podcasts and whether he considers the types of models that we build to be strategic tools or operational tools. And he thinks it's both. And from a school perspective, they can use these types of data for managing their area with just looking at direct costs. But from a strategic perspective for the overall institution, including all of the overhead in the model is important for that strategic view. And then being able to use that from, from our perspective, we can then use that to put into the predictive model so that uh, institutions can then plan and budget based upon demand or what they're hoping to achieve in growing particular programs or growing particular students or removing um, some programs or courses and then use that demand to be able to then build up that baseline for the, uh, the budget going forward rather than just using uh, sort of incremental budgeting as a basis? Yeah, there's a couple of really interesting points inside of that, that that I wouldn't mind touching on. Sure. The first of them is that I've increasingly, this is a personal view, come to think about budgeting as a kind of three-dimensional matrix. So, yeah, one of the dimensions is, is time, and it brings us to the point we were just discussing about multi-year budgeting, and that's fine. So you can imagine that on the x-axis. And then on the other axis, on the y-axis, then you've got the allocation to and expenses within individual organisational units. Yeah. Now, that two-dimensional matrix is traditional budgeting, if you like. But what's missing from that is there's not a dimension that looks functionally across the university, which is really what your activity-based models do. So if you've got a two-dimensional matrix, you cannot see HR all the way through the university. Yeah. Yeah. You can't see teaching all of the way through the university. So you've really got to have the ability to budget in three dimensions. You've got to be able to budget over time. You've got to be able to budget between organisational units and you've got to be able to budget across activities. And so whether whether we're talking about either of the predominant styles at the moment, incremental budgeting or responsibility centre budgeting, they both typically fail to capture all of the dimensions that are needed to create a comprehensive plan financial plan for the university. Yep. In principle, responsibility centre management is a better model for coping with downturns. Yep. But you've also got to take it back to that overarching question of strategy again. So one thing to be in a downturn and to cope with the downturn, but what's the recovery strategy? What's the upswing strategy? And how does the university allocate scarce resources to support the upswing, yeah. to support the recovery, yep. to support its new plan. That's a really important point because there are, and we know there's a lot of universities that have done a lot of reduction of staff and then you know, just to deal with the immediate crisis, but then what do you do on the other side of the crisis? Yeah, I think there's a crisis and then there's a recovery and you've always got to be planning for the recovery as well as the crisis, isn't it? And and there's a couple of different dimensions to that recovery. One is how quickly can we recover, which tends to be what everyone thinks about. But the other question is, what do we want to look like when we do recover? And where do we allocate the resources to create that new look for the university? I mean, it's very rarely that universities experience a downturn, just want to grow back to the way they were before. Usually it prompts a 
reconsideration and a rethink to some extent about what we want to look like in the future. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have today. So thank you very much for your time today, Chris. Thanks, Lee. It was a pleasure. I could have talked for ages about it. <laughs> I'm surprised how much of this stuff I remember. <laughs> well done. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Lee. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Pilbara Insights, the podcast, the first dedicated audio series to support higher education leaders in their academic resource management decisions. Pilbara Group would like to give special thanks to Chris Grange for his valuable work and contribution to today's podcast. Thank you also to all of our listeners. If you'd like to learn more, please visit our website at pilbaragroup.com and stay tuned for the next episode of Pilbara Insights, the podcast coming soon.